Every afternoon, Thomas the Tank Engine puffs along his branch line with Annie and Clarabelle. First, they pass the water mill. Next, they come to a big farm. Then, they can see a bridge with a village nestled either side of it. This is a special place. Whenever children hear Thomas coming along, they stand on the bridge waving until he is out of sight. One day, Thomas was running late. He had stopped at the signal before the bridge to talk to some new children. Percy the green engine was waiting too. Hurry up, Thomas, called Percy when the signal dropped. If you're late, Sir Topham Hatt may get a new engine to replace you. He would never do that, thought Thomas, but he was worried. Next day, Thomas hurried along the line. Just ahead was the goods yard. There, on the platform, was an inspector waving a red flag. Next, Thomas saw some children. They were waving, too. Something must be wrong, thought Thomas. This station is for goods, not passengers. Help, Thomas, help! We're glad to see you, called the children. Please, will you take us home? The station master explained to Thomas's driver that the school bus had broken down and all the parents would be worried if the children were late. Thomas waited as the children walked down from the bridge. Then he took the children to the next station where Bertie was waiting to take them home. When Thomas finished his journey, he was very late. He was worried that Sir Topham Hatt might be cross with him. I warned Thomas, puffed Percy to James. He's been late one time too many. He'll be in trouble now. But next morning when Thomas picked up his passengers, Sir Topham Hatt was nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness, sighed Thomas. Thomas knows every part of his branch line. Just ahead was a stretch where the hot sun had bent the rails on the track. Careful, Thomas, called his driver, but it was too late. That's done it, said his driver. We shan't get any further today. But what about my passengers, asked Thomas. Don't worry, they'll be looked after, replied his driver. While workmen repaired the line, Thomas had to shunt freight cars in the yard. Bertie came to see him. I understand you need my help again. Yes, Bertie, replied Thomas sadly. I can't run without my rails. Bertie set off to collect Thomas's passengers. Hello, Bertie, they said. We're glad you're here. Bertie drove along the road that runs by the railway. He stopped at each station along the line. Sometimes he stopped between stations to let people off closer to their homes. Thomas felt miserable. I've lost my passengers to Bertie. They'll like him better than me. Sir Topham had arrived. Your branch line is repaired. I'm going to change your timetable so that you and Bertie can work together more. When Thomas reached the station, there to his relief were all his passengers. Bertie is a good bus, but we missed our train rides with you, they said. Later, Thomas spoke to Bertie. Thank you for looking after my passengers. That's all right, Thomas. I like to make new friends, but I'm glad to share them with you. You're a good friend indeed, replied Thomas, and always will be. Thank you.
Trevor the traction engine is old fashioned, but he doesn't care. He knows that he is really useful, like his friend Edward, the blue engine. Early one morning, Trevor was chuffing about the vicarage orchard. He had important news for Edward. The vicar says that not all children are able to have holidays by the sea, so he's having a garden party to raise money for a seaside trip. I'm going to be the star attraction, chatted Trevor, giving rides to all the visitors. The vicar is putting up posters all about it. I'd like to help too, sighed Edward, but without my rails, I wouldn't be much good at a garden party. It was a beautiful day, but Edward was worried. I wish there was something I could do for the party, he said. I'd like to be helpful, like Trevor. Edward's driver laughed. You're helpful in your own way, and that's on the railway. Next day, it was Trevor's turn to look disappointed. He had bad news. The vicar's been so busy that he forgot to put up the posters. Now no one will know about the party. But Edward had an idea. Don't worry, he said. Everything is going to be all right. Then he explained to his driver. The vicar can paste his posters on my cab and coaches, so wherever I go, they'll go too. Well done, Edward, said his driver. I'm sure Sir Topham Hatt will agree. As indeed he did. Edward steamed happily through the stations, collecting his passengers. Look, they said, the vicar is holding a party. We must go to that. Later, Trevor was resting in the orchard shed when Bertie rolled by. Hello, Trevor. Why are you dozing there like an old stick in the mud? I'm not dozing. I'm resting, replied Trevor. Then he told Bertie about the vicar's party. I'll be there too, boasted Bertie. I'm not sure people will want to ride on an old traction engine after traveling in a smart red bus like me. The party day arrived. It had rained heavily during the night and the orchard ground was soaked. Rain and mud won't spoil my day, said Trevor. No, indeed, agreed his driver. We'll stay on the road, then we won't get bogged down. Trevor was soon busy trundling up and down the quiet country lane, carrying lots of laughing children. He was just turning a corner when he heard Bertie. Hello, old timer. I'm taking everyone to the party. People have come from all over the island. Trevor gave Bertie a cheerful whistle and turned back toward the orchard. Then there was trouble. Help, I'm stuck, shouted Bertie. His wheels had sunk deep in the orchard mud. Terence the tractor arrived just in time. I'm the one who has to plow fields, laughed Terence. We'd better get you out of here. Using strong ropes, Terence and Trevor pulled Bertie clear of the mud. This will teach Bertie a thing or two, Trevor chuffered to himself. At last, Bertie was on the road again. Thank you, Trevor. You're not a stick in the mud at all. No, smiled Trevor. But you were, just for a little while. That evening, the vicar arrived to see Edward and his driver. Thanks to your good idea about the posters, hundreds of people paid to come to the party. We've raised lots of money for the children. Edward was very pleased, and Trevor fell happily asleep, thinking of all the children who would now get to the seaside at last.
Duck and Percy enjoy their work at the harbor, pulling and pushing cars full of cargo to and from the quay. But one morning, the engines were exhausted. The harbor was busier than ever. Sir Topham Hatt promised that another engine would be found to help them. Huh, it's about time, said Percy. I ache so much I can hardly get my wheels to move, agreed Duck. They waited for the engine to arrive. It came as a shock when he did. Good morning, squirmed Diesel in his oily voice. The two engines had not worked with Diesel for a long time. What are you doing here, gasped Duck. Your worthy top, uh, Sir Topham Hatt sent me. I hope you are pleased to see me again. I am to shunt some dreadfully tiresome cars. Shunt where? said Percy suspiciously. Where? Why, from here to there, purred Diesel. And then again from there to here. Easy, isn't it? With that, Diesel, as if to make himself quite clear, bumped some cars hard. Oh! screamed the cars. Grrr, growled Diesel. Percy and Duck were horrified. They did not trust Diesel at all. They refused to work and would not leave their shed. Sir Topham Hatt was enjoying his tea and iced bun when the telephone rang. So there's trouble in the harbor yard? I'll be there right away. Diesel was working loudly and alone. Cargo lay on the quay. Ships and passengers were delayed. Everyone was complaining about Sir Topham Hatt's railway. Percy and Duck were sulking in their shed. What's all this? demanded Sir Topham Hatt. We're on strike, sir, said Percy nervously. Yes, added Duck. Beg pardon, sir, but we won't work with Diesel, sir. You said you sent him packing, sir. I have to give Diesel a second chance, replied Sir Topham Hatt. I'm trying to help you by bringing Diesel here. Now you must help me. He was the only engine available. Percy and Duck went sadly back to work. Next morning, things were no better. Diesel's driver had not put his brakes on properly and Diesel started to move. He went bump straight into Percy. Wake up there, Percy, scowled Diesel. You have work to do. He didn't even say he was sorry to Percy. Later, Diesel bumped the car so hard that the loads went everywhere. What will Sir Topham Hatt say? gasped Percy. He won't like it, said Duck. So who's going to tell him, I wonder? Two goody-goody tattletales like you, I suppose? Percy and Duck did not want to be tattletales, so they said nothing. Diesel, thinking he could get away with his bad behavior, was ruder than ever. Next day, he was shunting freight cars full of china clay. He banged the cars hard into the buffers, but the buffers weren't secure. The silly cars were sunk. Sir Topham had heard the news. The cars were hoisted safely from the sea, but the clay was lost. Sir Topham Hatt spoke severely to Diesel. The harbor master has told me everything. Things worked much better here before you arrived. I shall not be inviting you back. Now, Duck and Percy, I hope you won't mind having to handle the work by yourselves again. Oh, no, sir. Yes, please, sir, replied the engines. Whistling cheerfully, they puffed back to work while Diesel sulked slowly away.
It was an important day in the yard. Everyone was busy and excited, making notes and taking photographs. A special visitor had arrived and was now the center of attention. Who is that? whispered Thomas to Duck. That, said Duck proudly, is a celebrity. A what? asked Percy. A celebrity is a very famous engine, replied Duck. Driver says we can talk to him soon. Oh, said Thomas, he's probably too famous to even notice us. Just then, Gordon arrived. Huh, said Gordon. Who cares? A lot of fuss about nothing, if you ask me. And he steamed away. Later that night, the engines found that the visitor wasn't conceited at all. He enjoyed talking to the other engines till long after the stars came out. He left early next morning. Gordon was still complaining. Good riddance, he grumbled, chattering all night. Who is he anyway? Duck told you, replied Thomas. He's famous. As famous as me? Nonsense. He's famouser than you. He went a hundred miles an hour before you were even thought of. Huh, so he says, huffed Gordon. But I didn't like his looks. He's got no dome. Never trust domeless engines. They're not respectable. I never boast, but I'd say a hundred miles an hour would be easy for me. Goodbye. Duck took some freight cars to Edward's station. Hello, called Edward. That famous engine came through this morning. He whistled to me. Wasn't he kind? He's the finest engine in the world, replied Duck. Then he told Edward what Gordon had said. Take no notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. He thinks no engine should be famous but him. Look, he's coming now. Gordon was running very fast. His wheels pounded the rails. He did it, I'll do it. He did it, I'll do it. Gordon's train rocketed past and was gone. He'll knock himself to bits, chuckled Duck. Gordon's driver eased him off. Steady, Gordon. We aren't running a race. We are, then, said Gordon, but he said it to himself. Suddenly, Gordon began to feel a little strange. The top of my boiler seems funny, he thought. It feels as if something is loose. I'd better go slower. But it was too late. On the viaduct, they met the wind. It was a teasing wind which blew suddenly in hard puffs. Gordon thought it wanted to push him off the bridge. No, you don't, he said firmly. But the wind had other ideas. It curled round his boiler, crept under his loose dome, and lifted it off and away into the valley below. Gordon was most uncomfortable. The cold wind was whistling through the hole where his dome should be, and he felt silly without it. At the big station, the freight cars laughed at him. Gordon tried to reach them away. But they crowded around no matter what he did. On the way back to the shed, he wanted his driver to stop and fetch his dome. We'll never find it now, said the driver. You'll have to go to the works for a new one. Gordon was very cross. I hope the shed is empty tonight, he huffed to himself. But all the engines were there waiting. Never trust domeless engines, said a voice from somewhere behind him. They aren't respectable.
Duck, the great western engine, worked hard in the yard at the big station. Sometimes he pulled coaches. Sometimes he pushed freight cars. But whatever the work, Duck got the job done without fuss. One day, Duck was resting in the shed when Sir Topham Hatt arrived. Your work in the yard has been good. Would you like to have a branch line for your own? Yes, please, sir, replied Duck. So Duck took charge of his new branch line. The responsibility delighted him. The line runs along the coast by sandy beaches till it meets a port where big ships come in. Duck enjoyed exploring every curve and corner of the line. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. Soon, Duck was busier than ever. Sir Topham Hatt was building a new station at the port. Duck pulled the heavy freight cars wherever they were needed. Bertie looked after Duck's passengers and the other engines helped too, but the work took a long time. Noise and dust filled the air. Don't worry, whistled Toby, the station's nearly finished. And on time, too, said Duck thankfully. Duck felt his responsibility deeply and talked endlessly about it. You don't understand, Donald, how much Sir Topham Hatt relies on me. Ach, aye, muttered Donald sleepily. I'm Great Western, and I... Quack, quack, quack. What? Ye heard? Quack, quack, ye go. Sounds like ye'd an egg laid. Now wheesht and let an engine sleep. Quack yourself, said Duck indignantly. Later, he spoke to his driver. Donald says I quack as if I'd laid an egg. Quack, do you? pondered his fireman. He whispered something to Duck and his driver. They were going to play a joke on Donald and pay him back for teasing Duck. The engines were busy for the rest of the day and nothing more was said. Not even a quack. But when at last Donald was asleep, Duck's driver and fireman popped something into his water tank. Next morning when Donald stopped for water, he found that he had an unexpected passenger aboard. A small white duckling popped out of his water tank. Now, do, who's behind this? laughed Donald. The duckling was tame. She shared the fireman's sandwiches and rode in the tender. The other engines enjoyed teasing Donald about her. Presently, she grew tired of traveling and hopped off at a station. And there she stayed. That night, Donald's driver and fireman got busy. And in the morning, when Duck's crew arrived to look him over, they laughed and laughed. Look, Duck, look what's under your bunker. It's a nest box with an egg in it. Donald opened a sleepy eye. Well, 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 you must have laid it in the night, Duck, all unbeknownst. Then Duck laughed, too. You win, Donald. It'd take a clever engine to get the better of you. There's a pond near the Duckling Station. Here she often swims and welcomes the trains as they pass by. The station master calls her Dilly, but to everyone else, she is always Donald's duck.
Percy works in the yard at the big station. He loves playing jokes, but they can get him into trouble. One morning, he was very cheeky indeed. Beep, beep! Hurry up, Gordon. The train's ready. Gordon thought he was late. Laughed Percy and showed him a train of dirty coal cars. Gordon thought how to get back at Percy for teasing him. Next, it was James's turn. Stay in the shed today, James. Sir Topham Hatt will come and see you. Ah, thought James. Sir Topham Hatt knows I'm a fine engine. He wants me to pull a special train. James's driver and fireman could not make him move. The other engines grumbled dreadfully. They had to do James's work as well as their own. At last, the inspector arrived. Show a wheel, James. You can't stay here all day. Sir Topham Hatt told me to stay here. He sent a message this morning. He did not. How could he? He's away for a week. Oh, said James. Oh, where's Percy? Percy had wisely disappeared. When Sir Topham Hatt came back, he was cross with James and Percy for causing so much trouble. But the very next day, Percy was still being cheeky. I say, you engines, I'm to take some freight cars to Thomas's Junction. Sir Topham Hatt chose me especially. He must know I'm a really useful engine. More likely he wants you out of the way, grunted James. Gordon looked across to James. They were going to play a trick on Percy. James and I were just speaking about signals at the Junction. We can't be too careful about signals. But then I needn't say that to a really useful engine like you, Percy. Percy felt flattered. We had spoken of backing signals, put in James. They need extra special care, you know. Would you like me to explain? No, thank you, James, said Percy. I know all about signals. Percy was a little worried. I wonder what backing signals are, he thought. Never mind, I'll manage. He puffed crossly to his freight cars and felt better. He came to a signal. Bother! It's a danger. The signal moved to show line clear. Its arm moved up instead of down. Percy had never seen that sort of signal before. Down means go, and up means stop. So upper still must mean go back. I know. It's one of those signals. Come on, Percy, said his driver. Off we go. Stop! You're going the wrong way. But it's a backing signal, Percy protested and told him about Gordon and James. The driver laughed and explained. Oh, dear, said Percy. Let's start quickly before they see us. He was too late. Gordon saw everything. That night, the big engines talked about signals. They thought the subject was funny. Percy thought they were being very silly.
At night, when the other engines are tucked away in their sheds, you can still hear the faraway call of an engine's whistle and the clickety-clack of train wheels turning. This is the sound of the mail train. One train is pulled by Thomas and the other by Percy, as the loads are too heavy for one engine to do the work alone. The mail is loaded into freight cars at the harbors, and the engines pull their trains through the silent stations delivering their precious loads. On a clear night, a big shiny moon brightens their journey, but often Thomas and Percy can't even see the stars. But whatever the weather, lamps along the track always light their way. One night, Percy was waiting at the junction. The main line train was late. At last, Henry arrived. Sorry, he puffed. The mail boat from the mainland was delayed. Come on, Percy, said his driver. Let's make up for lost time. Percy puffed along as quickly as he could, but the sun was already rising as he finished his work. Never mind, thought Percy. It's nice to be up and about when it's the start of a new day and there's no one else around. Percy was not alone for long. Bother, said Percy. It's that dizzy thing, Harold. Good morning, word Harold. I always said railways were out of date, but you're so slow with the mail. You should give everyone their stamps back. Percy was too tired to explain. Bird brain, he muttered. Good morning, Percy, called Duck. You're up early this morning. No, you're wrong, sighed Percy. I'm back, tired and late. He rolled into the shed and fell asleep almost before his buffers touched the bar. His driver decided to set off early that evening. Thomas was waiting at the station. Thank goodness I have a chance to speak to you. Driver says that the person in charge of the mail has complained to Sir Topham Hatt about the delay last night. But that wasn't my fault, replied Percy. I know, said Thomas, and so does Sir Topham Hatt. But this mail person wouldn't listen. Tonight we'll just have to be quicker than ever before. The engines were just leaving when they heard a familiar buzzing. I say, you two, there's news flying about. Where? puffed Percy crossly. All over the place. They're going to scrap the mail train and use me instead. Wings work wonders, you know. Always. Rubbish! huffed Thomas. That night, everything ran like clockwork. Thomas and Percy steamed through the stations, making good time everywhere they went. At a station, Thomas noticed a man looking cold and worried. He had missed his train home. We can give you a ride, said Thomas's driver, but it will be rather uncomfortable. Thank you, said the man. Anything's better than sitting here. The next afternoon, Percy passed the airfield and saw Harold. Hello, lazy wings. Are you too tired to fly today? The wind's too strong, grumbled Harold. I've been grounded. You need rails, laughed Percy. They work wonders, you know, always. That night, Sir Topham Hatch showed the two engines a letter. It was from the man who missed his train. He thinks you are both splendid, and everyone says that the mail train is the pride of the line. 